business news from the Capital Region. This is Washington Business Report with ABC7 National Correspondent Rebecca Cooper. Welcome to a fresh look at business and finance in the Washington region. We have a great show coming up today, including how military cuts could hurt Washington wallets, what a new tax bill means for you, and an author who argues the U.S. has taken the wrong lessons from 9-11, and that's hurting our economy and much more. But first, it was a busy week in business. Let's take a look at the week in review. This week, the market again proved investors are in the mood to find good news just about anywhere. Take Target. Thanks to the big data breach over the holidays and what's been dubbed a dud rollout in Canada, Target announced Wednesday fourth quarter profits dipped a full 46 percent. But losses were less than expected, so shoppers on Wall Street celebrated, snatching up Target stock and more. The Dow on Thursday saw the S&P 500 hit another record high. But will it last? With so many in the Washington area counting on the Pentagon for a paycheck, from contractors to those who serve, this week started with a bracing jolt of reality for our region. On Monday, Defense Secretary Chuck Hagel blasted cuts mandated by Congress, but says if he has to make them, cuts will come at the expense of manpower, unnecessary weapon systems, more base closures, and cuts to benefits rather than readiness. Given these realities, we must now adapt, innovate, and make difficult decisions to ensure that our military remains ready and capable maintaining its technological edge over all potential adversaries. This week, President Obama toured a Minnesota Metro Rail construction site, calling on Congress to boost spending on infrastructure, warning there will be major consequences if a transportation bill isn't passed by this summer. We could see construction projects stopping their tracks, machines sitting idle, workers off the job. So next week, I'm going to send Congress a budget that funds rebuilding our transportation infrastructure in a more responsible way by doing it over four years, which gives cities and states and private investors the certainty they need to plan major projects. And in Arlington, Governors McAuliffe, O'Malley and D.C. Mayor Gray got together Wednesday at Virginia Tech's Research Center to announce a new infusion of $75 million towards Metro's goal of easing congestion with higher capacity trains and talking other top priorities. Collaboration is the new competition when it comes to creating jobs, spurring innovation, and uh, developing especially emerging sectors. When we act as a region, I just don't think anybody can compete with us. So even at this love fest, we had to ask, with D.C. having hiked its minimum wage and Governor O'Malley pushing for one statewide in Maryland, any concerns about competition now that Virginia has firmly rejected a minimum wage boost? Nope. At least that's what they're saying on camera. Study after study has shown absolutely no job displacement when it comes to one jurisdiction on one side of the border. Uh, so uh, we're all concerned about jobs. There is no jobs without progress. But in terms of phobias and fears about people, you know, packing up uh, and, and moving because of minimum wage, I don't have that, that fear or that phobia. I would just echo what uh, Governor O'Malley has said. We're excited, frankly, to be able to offer a higher wage uh, to the people in the District of Columbia. I don't worry about any displacement. I think we're, all of our jurisdictions are growing uh, at this stage. And while we had him, we asked Governor McAuliffe, is he as frustrated by Metro delays for the Silver Line yet again as riders are. I want to do whatever we can. I've asked my Secretary of Transportation to work with them. If there's anything Virginia can do to move along the process of getting these seven deficient requirements done, we'll do whatever we need to do. But it's important that it be done right, and uh, we're not going to accept it, obviously, uh, until everything is done as the contract called for. But I'm hopeful uh, very soon we'll be riding on the Metro. Governor McAuliffe also weighed in on his meetings with hospitals and care providers this week. He's joining the Virginia Chamber of Commerce and state business leaders, pushing Republicans in the General Assembly to reverse course and accept billions of dollars in Medicaid funding they've rejected. I have to compete against all these states that are now getting Virginia taxpayer dollars are now being used in their state to provide health care for their citizens. It doesn't make any sense. To date, we have forfeited $270 million that we could have brought back to the Virginia economy. We forfeit $5.2 million per day. It's time to get this done. Those 400,000 Virginia families have waited long enough. Thanks, well, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. 
Well, here to talk about all the week's highs and lows, economist Peter Morisi of the Washington Business Journal's Jill Atoro and Politico White House reporter Reed Epstein. Jill, I want to start with you. You covered this beat and you wrote this week about who will be the winners and who will be the losers in the Washington region when it comes to military spending cuts. So give us names. <laughs> well, um, Lockheed kind of is a win and a loss, as they usually are. They're so large, they cover everything. But um, Joint Strike fighter, fighter, generally speaking, went untouched. It's still the little darling of Which the Pentagon. Which wasn't a certainty well, going in? Wasn't really certainty, but I think more than anything, I, they're stuck with it. There were a couple members of Congress that said the other day at a conference that, you know what, it's not going anywhere. We've got it. It's moving forward. What they could see if sequestration stays in place is some, you know, bump into the right, some delays and so forth. But they're safe on that. They got hit a little bit with the literal combat ship uh, fleet. Uh, not only did um, the Pentagon confirm reports that they are going to buy fewer than they originally planned, but Hagel kind of kind of slammed the program and the Navy for relying too heavily on that particular um, ship in terms of And that's of primarily Lockheed or all like Lockheed? Um, primarily Lockheed in terms of the local re region. Um, they, they split it with a, another contractor that isn't located here. So who are, who are some of the other players that got hit? Um, General Dynamics and um, BAE systems both. Um, not a huge surprise, but in terms of the ground vehicle uh, program, that is kind of a no-go. So instead, what they might get is some modern modernization of their current fleets of tanks and those sorts of things. So they got they got hit. So well. Peter, um, in, in addition to other weapons that they're going to eliminate, the Warthog, possibly even an aircraft carrier, um, they're talking about touching salaries, benefits, uh, significantly downsizing the Army. As an economist, you know, California took a big hit after the Reagan years when they lost a lot of the defense spending money that they had grown used to. Are we going to see a recession in the Washington area if defense spending cuts continue? Actually, the Washington economy is much more diversified than it once was. For the people that work in these industries, yes, there's an issue. But, you know, last month, uh, this month, excuse me, uh, February, car sales were rather robust. I'm, I'm hearing from folks that I talk to that own dealerships. Even though I've spoken to Detroit and they said, you know, February is not a very good month for us because of the snow. There's a resiliency here. So I suspect that what's going to happen is these people are simply going to find other things to do. Okay, other things to do. Reed, I want to switch gears and talk about minimum wage with you because you heard Governors O'Malley and McAuliffe and Mayor Gray saying that they're not too worried about discrepancies in the minimum wage here in this area. But you've been covering the president. He continues to push for a federal lifting of the minimum wage. Tell us where that stands. Uh, well, it's essentially uh, not quite dead in the water, but it's still born at this point. There's no real cooperation coming from congressional Republicans on the minimum wage. The president and congressional Democrats are going to use it as a campaign uh, hitch through the year and through the fall. Uh, and partly why you see you had saw all three Democrats there, uh, Gray, McAuliffe, and O'Malley, certainly aren't going to cross the president uh, on in what the national Democratic messaging is on the minimum wage. They're all going to say, essentially, take the White House line that it doesn't make any difference as far as job, jobs are when neighboring jurisdictions have different minimum wages. Peter Morisi, no matter what happens with the federal minimum wage, D.C. law now reads that it has to be a dollar higher, whatever the federal minimum wage. Business leaders have said they are worried that businesses will pick up and move to Virginia. Governor O'Malley says he's not worried if he raises his statewide minimum wage. We've already got it higher in Prince George's County, Montgomery County. Do you agree with those studies Governor O'Malley alluded to that says there no. makes no difference? Governor O'Malley likes to pretty much hew the party line. He echoes what the Obama administration says on just about every policy issue. The studies we have on minimum wage look at small changes in the minimum wage or situations where we have a captive market. For example, you could raise the minimum wage in Manhattan and people are still going to go to Radio City Music Hall. It's not at all clear that you can raise the minimum wage substantially in Montgomery County and not have some leakage of economic activity to Fairfax County. It's that simple. And we can count on Governor O'Malley to hold his line, and we can count on you to hold your line. We've got more to talk about with the whole group when we come back. Stay with us for more. We're back with Peter Marisi, Jill Toro, and Reed Epstein. And as usual, Peter's talking during the break because we have so much to get to. Uh, so, Jill, I want to turn to you on something really uh, interesting you wrote this week. Many times on this show, when we've asked people where they should be looking to the future in terms of growth, we've said cybersecurity, cybersecurity, cybersecurity. You wrote this week with these cuts coming in military spending. Mm -hmm. 
don't expect cybersecurity to be the cure for all spending ills. Talk about that. No, at least among the federal contracting community, it has just been the hot market to get into, and any time there's a hot market to get into, everybody runs to it. There was an analogy at a conference earlier this week where someone said everybody's running for the ball. Not everybody is going gonna, is gonna to be able to get there. So uh, basically what's happening is um, I believe someone uh, gave an estimate of about $50 billion in cybersecurity opportunity, perhaps, depending how you define cybersecurity. $50 billion in opportunity, meaning that's where how much spending to expect. That's how much spending to expect, and that is far less than the than the cuts that are happening. So there is just not enough to um, in cybersecurity to make up for defense losses. So what we're ha seeing in the short term is this run to the ball, so to speak, and all these cybersecurity companies are getting bought for um, valuations that are sky high. Um, and in the end, there's not going to be enough work to actually maintain. You're those warning companies. now, and you warned two years ago. Watch mm -hmm. out, an economic bubble could be forming over cybersecurity. I can tell Peter's itching to weigh in on this. Too bad, my dear. I've got, to get you, I've got to get you on something that also affects everyone in this region, taxes, because we saw the big, massive, almost 1,000-page tax plan rolled out by Ways and Means Committee Chairman Dave Camp. Everybody knows it's not going to pass as written, but it's got some interesting ideas that a lot of people are talking about. Take apart the tax plan. What's the good? What's the bad? What's the ugly? Well, the good thing is it tries to streamline the code by eliminating a lot of deductions and exemptions, consolidating them, increasing the standard deduction so more people can file the short form and not worry about keeping receipts 95% would be able to skip I, itemizing I will, altogether. I, for Missouri on the 95%. We'll just leave it on that. <laughs> the, the, the bad, I don't know what that means. The bad is, <laughs> and, and at the same time, it doesn't change the progressive nature. of the, It's about as progressive as before. However, within groups of people, within income groups, there's going to be winners and losers. And so there's going to be a lot of people screaming as they lose a benefit and what they get back, say, in a bigger standard deduction isn't there. And the ugly, I mean, Senator Schumer, quite correctly said, dead on arrival. It's going to just lead to a lot of partisan rancor, and we really can't achieve tax reform with this president and this House. It's not possible. Reid, I want to get your take on that, but first I'll weigh in with my views on it. I think the good is that it does try to lower rates to help some, to help all businesses, and it does help some. The Retail Federation likes this bill. Most others, as you and I talked about before, Wall Street hated it by and large. Um, I like that it tries to end some of the special deductions that shouldn't be there. I don't think anyone thinks oil companies are really hurting right now. On the other hand, I think there are some tax breaks that are good policy from uh, it's clean energy to the earned income tax credit that encourages uh, lower income Americans to work. So what was what's the take from the White House? What was really interesting was uh, that we saw big banks and Wall Street come out vociferously against this tax bill, a tax bill that everyone knows is going nowhere. And they wanted to make it clear that they don't defending their turf, not losing an inch of even theoretical ground on, on this, uh, and making sure that Republicans know that they need to heed what Wall Street wants or else they'll be cut off from donations. So end of discussion for now, it looks like on tax reform, but it was a nice 1,000 page effort by Dave Camp, <laughs> and I think one still worth discussing as we go. Well, when we come back, our next guest says the U.S. has made some serious mistakes post 9-11, and it's impacting the economy. Stay tuned for her prescription on what needs to be fixed. Oh, yeah.